Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you have given to us. It is a new day, a special day, a wonderful day that you have made. We thank you that your mercies are new every single morning. And we thank you, Lord, that you have also promised that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you're here in our midst. And so we thank you for being present among us. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we continue the Gospel of Luke, we pray, Lord, that you would touch my tongue to anoint, you know, anoint it so that I can give the message you have given to me. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we begin where we left off with Luke before Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's been a while. Anyway, Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all the things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. It is indeed a fascinating text. I mean, how is it that Jesus' words could be so clear and yet the disciples not understand them. Now, in Mark chapter 8, Peter understood clearly enough what Jesus said, because in Mark, Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark 10, Jesus tells them the same basic thing. And in Mark chapter 8, the first time he heard it, Peter rebuked Jesus uh, for saying such a thing. And of course, for that, Peter received his own rebuke from Jesus. But here in Luke's Gospel, Luke records that the disciples did not understand Jesus' words, even though as we read them from our perspective, they appear to be quite clear to us. Well, of course, we have the perspective of history. They did not have that perspective. But what's really important for us to understand is that when God so chooses, he can hide stuff from us so that we do not understand what is going on. I suppose in this particular case, he was hiding it from them at the particular moment so that they could not be anxious for those things to happen. I mean, when it did happen, they were anxious enough. So why, why give them that anxiety ahead of time? That may be it. But, you know, it makes you wonder, what's he hiding from us now? You know, what's he hiding from us now? And, uh, and of course, we don't know. <laughs> Because it's hidden. So, verse 35. Then it happened, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, I find this to be rather fascinating. You know, what we know is that Jesus is nearing Jericho. We know that a blind man is by the road begging. He hears a multitude passing by. He can't see them, of course, but he hears them. Now, how often multitudes came or went from Jericho, we don't know. However, the presence of a multitude passing by this man or coming near at this point led him to, to ask what their presence meant. And he was told Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. The man was told nothing more, nothing less. Nevertheless, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's interesting. Because nobody said that Jesus is the son of David. They just said Jesus of Nazareth is coming. So how did this blind man, who probably sat at this one spot every single day, make the jump from Jesus of Nazareth 
to Jesus, son of David. That's interesting. Well, we aren't given the answer to that in the text. Now, curiosity led me to search all of the Gospels for how many times Jesus visited Jericho. And this is actually the only time we have recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that Jesus went to Jericho. That's what we have recorded for us. And John, he didn't go to Jericho at all. So I find that to be rather interesting. So we've got to wonder, or at least I had to wonder, how this man could make the jump from Jesus of Nazareth to Jesus, son of David. I can only surmise, and this is speculation on my part, okay, that as this man sat by the road begging, as he probably did each day, that he heard conversations and snippets of conversations about Jesus and what he was doing throughout Judea and Galilee. And just maybe this man longed for the day that Jesus would come to Jericho. I'm just thinking, you know, he wasn't going to go to Jerusalem. He's in Jericho. He's a blind man. You know, you just can't catch an Uber ride or whatever or anything like that. You had to walk the distance. Now, Jericho itself wasn't that far. Uh, it was like 27.6 miles from Jerusalem or a seven-hour walk. Now, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to walk that in a mile. I mean, I know that I've done, you know, six-kilometer walks, you know, when they were trying to collect money for whatever and whatever. You know, after those six kilometers, I'm like going, okay, I don't want to take another step. So a seven-hour, 27.6-mile walk, no. But, of course, they were used to it. That's how they got everywhere. So that was, that was normal for them. So anyway, since it was pretty close to Jerusalem, he could easily have heard about Jesus and what he did in Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee as people passed him by on the road. And he may have heard people wondering if Jesus could be the Messiah. Wondering out loud as they talked. Now if, again we're speculating here because we just don't know, if he was hearing people wondering out loud if Jesus was the Messiah, then he could have concluded that Jesus was the son of David because of all of Israel expected the Messiah to be the son of David because that's what the prophets talked about. Okay, so you have to make a few little, you know, connect the dots here of how this may have happened. You know, when a, when a blind man is sitting on the road, he's just, he's not, he's begging, but my goodness, his ears are working, and so he's hearing these things, and he's wondering out loud. Uh, and, of course, we cannot omit the possibility that God's Spirit is prompting all of this in this blind man as he called out to Jesus. And it could be all of the above. You know, that he'd heard all these people, he's heard what was going on in Jerusalem by this man Jesus, and, of course, the Holy Spirit is working in his life and in his heart. And so all of that could be taking place. Anyway, when we consider it, this man was not about to let Jesus pass him by without calling to him. He doesn't know if Jesus will ever be back in Jericho. This is his opportunity to cry out to him. And so he was blind. He was a beggar. He needed to at least try to ask for help from the one that he had been hearing from was doing miracles in Jerusalem, or everywhere he went, actually. Verse 39. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. Isn't that always amazing? Isn't it amazing how often we read of people who are around Jesus try to shut up the people who want to get to Jesus? It's like, this is our club, you know, don't join in, or something like that. You know, we know that when people were bringing little children to Jesus, I mean, they touched them. It was the disciples who were telling people, no, 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 no. And it was Jesus who said, let the little children come to me. All right? So now Jesus approaches Jer Jericho. He's not in Jericho yet. And he's surrounded by a throng of people. And those in front of Jesus, in, in front of the throng here, 
attempt to shut this man down. Well, thankfully, the blind beggar would have nothing of it. He needed Jesus. And the only thing he had available to him to get to Jesus was his voice. And so he cried out to Jesus, and the text states, but he cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? He'd asked for mercy. And so Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? Jesus' words are interesting. The man cried out for mercy. He says, What do you want me to do for you? And what would the man say? Well, he could have cried out for anything. I mean, there might have been something going on in this family that was bigger than his blindness. We don't know. But what we do know is that Jesus' question didn't put limits on himself or this man. He said, what would you have me do for you? There are no parameters here. It was just what. And so the one thing he needed is the one thing he asked for. Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Well, the Greek word for receive is in the imperative mood. So Jesus is actually commanding that this man's sight be restored to him or given to him. We don't know if it was a restoration, but that his sight would be given to him. Jesus made the command, and of course we know that it happened. But he also said, your faith has made you well. Well, what faith did the man display? Just this. He believed that Jesus could give him his sight. The man didn't say, if you could give me my sight, I would like to receive it. There was no if about it. This man absolutely believed that Jesus could give him his sight. The man believed, and that's all it took. But have we noticed, in a few short verses, Jesus has gone from being Jesus of Nazareth to Jesus, son of David, to Lord. It's an amazing display of acknowledging who the one who stood before him was. Yes, Jesus came from Nazareth, and yes, he was the son of David, but more important, he was and is Lord. Verse 43, and immediately he received his sight and followed him glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. And of course, that would be the response. Everybody would probably have their, their jaws dropping and their hearts leaping. And, you know, they would just be praising God for what they had seen. But notice that if they had shut the man down, he wouldn't have received their sight and, he, and you know, they... And he wouldn't have received his sight, and they wouldn't have had reason to glorify God at that particular moment. So we praise God that the man didn't give up. Luke 19, another familiar story here. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, collector and was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. All right, so there is some kind of a reputation Jesus has in Jericho, because Zacchaeus wants to see him. Jesus' name is not a, a nothing name. He's heard of it, and he wants to see it. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him. For he was going, Jesus was going to pass that way. You know, one of the things that I considered the Zacchaeus and the, the blind man, you know, we really realized they were both determined to see Jesus or find him or get in touch with him somehow. You know, the blind man cried out to Jesus, 
and he would not be silent. Zacchaeus, he had a height issue. Everybody around him was taller than him. So he, needing to see Jesus, wanting to see Jesus, climbed up a tree. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Now when I look at those words, they aren't much different than what we read in John chapter 4. Where Jesus, we are told, he had to go through Samaria. Well, most Jews did not go through Samaria. But on this particular day, we're told Jesus had to go to Samaria. And he stopped at Jacob's well. And it was the wrong time of the day for anybody to come out to draw water, except there was this one woman with a questionable past who came out, and there they had a he had a conversation with her, or they had a conversation. And, you know, she ended up being the first evangelist in the Bible because she went and told her whole town, could this man be the Messiah? He told me everything about myself. Could he be the Messiah? And all the town came out, and Jesus stayed with them two, three more days. But here it is. Jesus telling Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must stay at your house. Is this the father's assignment for today? Is that why he's going to Jericho? If there was a man named Zacchaeus who had a, a, a very great interest in who Jesus was, and was that the draw that got Jesus to go to Jericho? It could be. Because, you know, what does, what does the Bible say? That if we seek the Lord with our whole heart, we will find him. So, now this man, of course, everybody presumed was of questionable character because he was a tax collector. Everybody loves their tax collectors. So, everybody just assumed this man was a sinner. But Zacchaeus wasn't just any tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. And we are told he was very rich. But it had to be a shock to everybody Yes. Well, yeah. I'd be shocked if I was up a tree and Jesus says, Kathleen, come down. I've got to stay at your house today. Okay. So Zacchaeus, Jesus calls him by name. And, you know, Zacchaeus isn't exactly a household name. You know, it's not like John or Joe or Sally Sue, you know. It's like, huh? So Zacchaeus is called by name. So he made haste and came down, and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Now that's their assumption. But, come on, remember, there's always people around who can't stand something good happening to somebody else. But listen, do we not understand that there is none good, and no, not one? And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of, of God, and so we need to quit throwing stones. So Zacchaeus received him joyfully. And we're not told much of anything else, except then Zacchaeus in verse 8 stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Now that was the legal requirement. If somebody had stolen something from somebody, to restore it, to return it fourfold. Well, Zacchaeus' actions, they are immediate. He didn't say, well, Jesus, I'll think about it. I'll get back to you on Tuesday. He didn't say that. He states immediately that he's going to give half of his goods to the poor. He does this all voluntarily. And then he adds, and if statement. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Now Zacchaeus was not admitting guilt when he said if. He simply is stating that if he had taken anything from anyone by false accusation, he would restore it fourfold. What Zacchaeus was vowing to do was make, make right 
anything he may have done that was wrong. That was wonderful. Jesus' response in verse 9. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus called Zacchaeus a son of Abraham. Do we understand how rare that is in the Bible? That phrase, son of Abraham? There are only five places in the scriptures, five places, where the phrase, son of Abraham, is used. Two of them are in genealogy. One of them was, and Abraham's two sons were Isaac and Ishmael. The other one is in Paul's letter to the Galatians, where he talks about who the sons of Abraham, you know, by faith we become sons of Abraham. So it's like, it's not a, a son of Abraham. This is actually the only time in the Bible where a person is referred to as a son of Abraham. When Jesus calls Zacchaeus a son of Abraham, was he speaking genealogically? Well, yeah, I mean, he is a descendant physically of Abraham, you know, being a Jew. But I wonder if Jesus was referring more so to the Abrahamic-like faith that Zacchaeus now openly stated he had because he immediately turns from believing in Jesus to putting his faith into action. Remember, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness because he believed that God was able to enable his wife, he and his wife, to have a child even at their old age. So it, as you know, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That faith became action. Zacchaeus put his faith immediately into action, and so I really do believe that Zacchaeus is called a son of Abraham because his faith was like Abraham's, and Jesus lifts that out. One of the things we know of Jesus is that he came to seek and to save the lost. He was in Jericho on this particular day. There's a lost soul by the name of Zacchaeus. Or the need of being found by him. And at the end of the day, Jesus could say to his father, mission accomplished. He'd done what he had, what he had gone to do. Well, the mission of Jesus hasn't changed. It is still the same, and it will always be the same until Jesus returns. What's wonderful for us is that Jesus knows exactly where all these lost people are. I mean, none of us can see a person's heart. None of us can see and can know where a person is. Nobody can know exactly what a person needs. But Jesus the Holy, and the Holy Spirit, God the Father, they all know this. So that he's able to direct and bring together people, a believer in Jesus with somebody who needs Jesus, bring them all together so that the questions that need to be answered can be asked. Our thing that we need to do is we need to give the Lord just a, a blank check, so to speak, and say, Lord, where do you want me today and to whom do you want me to speak with? And then please give me the words or the actions of whatever it is that we need in order to carry out the task that you give us. The way at the end of the day, we can say, mission accomplished, Father. We did what you asked us to do. All three of these particular sections between Luke 18 and the first part of Luke 19, they're just wonderful texts, familiar texts. But still, there's new things to get out of them. The more we look at the text, the more the Spirit will open our eyes to see them. And that's, that's what really gets to be fantastic. Amen. Amen. Amen.